tonight. Grab a hymnal. Let's stand and sing higher ground. 462. Stand and sing together. 462. I'm pressing on on the first. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table and claim then I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my game is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table and a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled. For faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table and a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost heights and catch a gleam of glory bright. But till heaven I found, Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table and a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. All right, good singing. You can be seated. Welcome tonight to church. Looking forward to what God has in store. Isn't it beautiful outside? Did you recognize just the beauty of the, what's that little thing in the, the sky called? I can't remember, uh, the sun. We haven't seen a lot of that. And I, I thought it was supposed to be April, show, uh, April showers bring May flowers, but it's just been raining all month. But it's nice to see the abundant sunshine. And uh, hopefully we've got more uh, coming up uh, and in store for us. Looking forward to a great summer. Uh, and I, I hate this expression and it wasn't coined by my dad. I'm pretty sure that it's old as dirt. Uh, but we don't want to have a summer slump. We want to have a summer jump. You ever heard that one before? Uh, and so as we head into the summer months, I'm just anticipating that God's going to do some great things. Uh, and I'm looking forward to that and looking forward to a lot of different things that are going on and happening. And you'll hear the announcements here in a little bit. And Pastor might make mention of some of those things. But looking forward uh, to being busy about what the Lord is doing here in Wooden Valley Baptist Church. Remember a couple years ago when COVID was running rampant and there was nothing to do uh, for 12 months? I'm looking forward to having a busy summer doing what God wants us to do here uh, and trying to be effective uh, in the gospel, reaching the community. By the way, you'll hear this announcement here in just a little bit, but uh, the most important thing that was announced this morning and that will be announced tonight is this Saturday. This Saturday is uh, our Saturation Saturday, and please, if you're able to come out for that, uh, we need your help. We've got a lot of invitations that need to go out, and this is the prime week to do it. Uh, next week, or the uh, week after next week, uh, is right before the revival, uh, so this allows for enough time uh, during that week for people people to plan, to make preparations, to attend. Uh, and so if you're able to be here this Saturday, uh, the 14th at 1030 a.m., man, I tell you, we'll put you to work and we'll go knock out a couple of neighborhoods. Maybe it'll look like this outside uh, and get those accomplished, get those finished. But uh, let's ask the Lord's blessing upon the evening. Then we're going to sing another song. Offering will be here in just a little bit. I move things around. Uh, and so we'll pray for the service and then we're going to sing another song here in just a moment. Lord, we're thankful for your goodness and we want to just take a quick second uh, and just recognize your handiwork, uh, the sunshine and the evergreen trees and the beauty and the articulate uh, tapestry that we get to look at and we get to call home. It's beautiful outside uh, and you cannot look at the creation and you cannot look at the sun and, and the evergreen trees and think that this all just came about randomly. It was painted and it was created by you, by your hand. Uh, and it testifies of your glory. It testifies of who you are. You're a creative God. Uh, and so we want to give you glory for that. And also uh, thank you so much for creating us. And uh, this afternoon as I was walking up uh, to the church, just looking at our beautiful building, you've blessed us, Lord. You really have with a beautiful exterior and interior building 
building that houses a bunch of beautiful people. And Lord, we just want to thank you for your goodness uh, to us uh, and uh, what you're doing in and through the ministry of this church. We don't take it for granted. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd be with tonight, be with us as we get into the study and the series. Uh, and I pray that you would have your will and way and that we'd be an encouragement uh, and leave refreshed and, ta- and challenged as a result of the preaching. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd be with the songs that we sing, although uh, it's Sunday night, sometimes we kind of can get into autopilot, but we are just as much in the middle of the Lord's day as we were this morning. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to worship you in spirit and in truth even this evening uh, and that we would uh, uh, captivate ourselves with who you are, the things that you've done, that we'd worship you when we need to worship you, that we'd exalt and praise you when we need to praise you. Uh, And Lord, we're looking forward to how you're going to meet with us this evening. I pray that you'd be with all the moms and want to say thank you one more time for my mom. I'll call her here in just a little bit. Uh, But thank you for godly mothers and thank you for uh, uh, blessing us with Uh, examples. Lord, I I would not know you if it had not been for my mom. She led me to Christ. And so, Lord, I'm thankful for my mom and thankful for the mothers of Wooden Valley Baptist Church and uh, even those who do not have a mom or they've lost their mom. Uh, They have a lot of moms here at Wooden Valley and I'm so thankful for the ladies and the godly examples that we have here at our church. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd bless us tonight. Be with us as we sing this next song in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, stand and we're going to learn a new kind of new one kind of new one. It's a song called Come Thou Fount, Come Thou King. Uh, And you'll notice some of the words sound a little bit familiar. Some of them don't, uh, but no doubt you'll know, uh, especially that first verse, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Uh, And then there's a chorus that's been placed to this beautiful song. So let's learn it together. Come Thou Fount. You know this part. Sing it out. Ready? Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Tune my heart to sing Thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me ever to adore thee may i still thy goodness prove while the hope of endless glory fills my heart with joy and love come thou found come thou king come thou precious prince of peace hear your bride to you we sing come thou found of our blessing on the second i was lost I was lost in utter darkness Till you came and rescued me I was bound by all my sin When your love came and set me free Now my soul can sing a new song Now my heart has found a home Now your grace is always with me, and I'll never be alone. Come thou found, come thou king, come thou precious prince of peace. Hear your bride to you we sing. Come thou fount of our blessing. On the last. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Never let me wander from thee. Never leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Come thou found, come thou king, come thou precious prince of peace. Hear your bride to you we sing. Come thou found of our blessing. Come thou found, come thou king. Come thou precious.
precious Prince of Peace. Hear your bride to you we sing. Come thou fount of our blessing. Hear your bride to you we sing. Come thou fount of our blessing. Man, you sang it like you knew it. Good job. You can be seated. We'll sing that on Wednesday night, and we'll also sing that on next Sunday. What we're going to do at this time is go straight into our gospel highlights. And I'm going to start things off because I have had one that I've been itching to share. Uh, and so we're going to go straight into that, and I'll give you on the right side an opportunity to think about it. And we'll get to you here in just a second, uh, and we'll work our way left. Uh, but just quick, 30 seconds, all right? And I will set the tone. Uh, last week, getting stuff prepared uh, for painting, I went over to uh, Home Depot, and I met a guy named Gary. I've seen him before and I've had interactions with him before and he's always been probably the kindest older gentleman that I've ever met. Always super engaging and bubbly and friendly. Uh, one day, I remember several months ago, I had my uh, uh, Graceway hoodie on. Uh, what's the Graceway theme from last year that we had? Um, his will, not my will. And he knew that was a Bible verse. And so I knew that he was religious, but I've not had opportunity to connect with him. And so just a couple days ago, I got to connect with him. Uh, and it was the day that I was dressed for, it was Wednesday night, dressed for uh, preaching Wednesday night. I had the stripes on, you know. And uh, I was not in his line. I was in someone else's line. And they asked where I refereed. And I said, well, I'm a poser. I'm not actually a referee. I'm a pastor here at a, a local church. Uh, and so I'm getting ready to preach a series. Uh, and his ears perked up and he ignored the person that he was helping and he said you're a pastor and I said I am a pastor over at uh, Wooden Valley Baptist Church and lo and behold he used to be a, an interim pastor for about six or seven months at a Lutheran church and this was his testimony he said I was a part of that movement but I had to get out of that movement and he just said it outright doesn't know who I am doesn't know where I stand uh, so this is a really risky move on his part but he said I had to get out of there because they started allowing women pastors and they started allowing homosexual pastors and so I had to get out of that movement and so I asked him where he went to church now, uh, and he goes to some small community church, I can't remember the name of it, uh, but I was able to get out an invitation and invite him, and he says these words, he said, I guarantee you I'll be there, and, and so you pray for Gary, and better yet, if you need anything, don't go to Lowe's, go to Home Depot and Bothell, and find Gary and encourage him and let him know you're from my church, uh, and let him know that you're praying for him, and it'd be great to be able to see him uh, on Open House Sunday, so that's my testimony, all right, right side, ready, here we go, raise your hand if you have one on the right side, Danielle, go ahead. Daniel. I actually have things trying to make two different testimonies, but because <laughs> you learn from testimonies all over the week, I don't remember them. But I do know what happened today. I got a chance to answer prayer to have a heart to heart with my younger sister, the one who has heard me go off on folks in regards to the for real gospel and Jesus mm. versus whoever they be claiming and who they Jesus is. So she knows where I stand, and although she's still on this whole spiritual I just know for a fact that the Lord is somewhere somehow going to break through whatever is in her mind as far as the gospel is concerned to solidify whether or not she for real accepted Christ all those years ago mm. at a church we both used to attend. So that was, that was a very awesome moment. What's your name? Week, I, I you got some for next week. What's your sister's name? I can't remember. Dominique. Dominique, Dominique Danielle, and Daniel, correct? Don't call her Danny, all right? Don't pray for Danny either. Pray for Dominique. All right. Praise the Lord. Good stuff. Anybody else on this right side? Abby, did you raise your hand? Okay. You don't share the gospel. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this section right here, middle section right here. All right. Go ahead, Brother Mike. More, more lawnmower stories? No, no, no. Uh, my son took my wife out yesterday for Mother's Day, and I tagged along because I could get a preview on Facebook. And Yeah. So of course uh, That's good. So it may, may still be there. Who knows how many people scan it? Yeah. I do that all the time. If I, I'm not able to have an interaction with somebody, I'll leave it and tr try to leave it in an obvious place where somebody can see it. But I learned last year, you cannot put them in credit card readers. That's a felony. Don't do that. All right. But anywhere else, you can leave them there and hopefully somebody will pick them up. So that's great. All right. Anybody else in this section here? We'll move along to the left. All right. Go ahead, Brother Larry. 
I actually got to hear you share the gospel with him and invite him, and he sounded very interested. And so thank you for doing that. What's his name again, Mike? Michael Brayton. Michael Brayton. Pray for Michael. Pray that he'd be able to come. That's good. He's getting ready to retire. Is that right? And I thought he said he was looking for a church or in between churches or something like that. Yeah, that'd be a blessing. Anybody else in this section here? Left side. All right. Right side. Right here in this middle section. Middle section. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead, Brother Rob. So, uh, Amy and I got to take Avery out to uh, Olive Gardens last week. We had a really good talk, but in the process, our server came and he had a different look to him. So I said, Oh, I looked at his name and Sue, Sue Sombach or something. I just didn't really get it wrong. But anyway, I said, That's an unusual name. Where are you from? And he said, Nepal. I said, oh, wow. I said, I've only met. You're the second person I've ever met from Nepal. How did you get here? He said, Well, his dad left eight years ago and sacrificed for eight years to get the rest of the family in. It's a little bit of a story. And I said, we're going to get our food from you in a little while, and we're going to be praying for it. I said, is there anything we can pray for you about? Mm. Off with him. He, says, he says, yeah, would you please pray for my family? We're going through a bit of a crisis right now. So I said, we will. So we did pray for him during our meal. And at the end of the meal, when he came back, I said, I just want you to know, we did pray for you. He says, thank you so much. It's a real crisis going on. We appreciate that. Yeah. And we were going to give him a track, but we got mixed up. She paid. She always track. does. I yeah. was track. <laughs> That's neat. That is neat. You also have those little things at the table where you don't even use Yeah. Things. Oh, yeah. I've seen those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah. Just stick, a, stick one in the credit card reader. Isn't <laughs> yeah. That's actually a great tactic that they taught us in personal evangelism at Bible college. You will be surprised when you show a genuine care for somebody, a server or somebody in the community, even if they're not religious or spiritual, if you say, hey, we're getting ready to pray for our meal. Can I pray for you about something? Instant opportunity to be able to slip them a track or care the gospel or share the gospel because they know you care. That's a great, great, I don't want to use the word tactic. That's a great tool. Good stuff. Anybody else in this section here? Left side? All right, far left. Far left. All right, I, I'm getting a trend here. This side's more spiritual than this side over here. All right, next week we'll do the same thing. Grab a stack of invitations, uh, and I just got notification yesterday that uh, our 5,000 of the uh, Grace Unlimited cards are on their way, so hopefully they'll be here by next week. Looking forward to that. All right, let's stand and let's sing There Shall Be Showers of Blessing, 383 in your hymnal. On the first, sing it out. There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing. Sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling. But for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing. Precious reviving again Over the hills and the valleys Sound of abundance of rain Showers of blessing Showers of blessing we need Mercy drops round us are falling But for the showers we plead There shall be showers of blessing Send them upon us, O Lord Lord, grant to us now a refreshing. Come and now honor thy word. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, oh, that today they might fall. Now as to God we're confessing, now as on Jesus we call. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. 
Amen, good singing, you can be seated. Usher's gonna come forward. Pastor's got an announcement, but I'm gonna make one really quickly. Uh, this week is the last time that you can uh, rub and get a, attached to the green carpet that is in the vestibule, because next week it's gonna be gone, finally. By the time uh, that you come to church next Sunday, uh, the new carpet will be installed. And I just wanted to say, I'm excited and looking forward to getting this restoration behind us, our renovation behind us. And I wanted to say a special thank you to our deacons. Our deacons were here uh, over the past 48 hours uh, including Brother Daniel was also here, Brother Larry helped a little bit, uh, and we had some men that were here, and really were all day uh, Friday and a little bit of Saturday, they were painting the vestibule, did anybody notice that? Looks wonderful, looks great, and I'm looking forward to next week having it all installed and ready to go, and just a couple more minor things to do with the nursery, and we are approaching being finished with this restoration project, it only took us two and a half years, uh, but looking forward to seeing that, and so come back next week and be ready to be amazed. All right, Pastor, go ahead. If you notice the uh, color of the tile, it's different. The, the uh, carpet that's going to come in by next time that we uh, meet for Sunday, it'll be here and be installed and it matches the uh, tile out there. I'm looking forward to it. I really am. I'm looking forward to uh, <coughs> the, the, uh, <coughs> the upgrade. Um, before we take our, our offering, I've got a, a card for Emmanuel and Kate. They're going to be getting married this coming Saturday. As a matter of fact... I know their fam, uh, the uh, Jimenez and some others are going to be flying out there uh, and pray for us because I'm, do, I'm actually doing the ceremony and that's going to be uh, uh, this coming Saturday. They're graduating on Thursday, I believe it is, and then uh, they're turning around and getting married and, and Brother Emmanuel is going off to uh, serve in the church on the east and so we're really proud of him. Finally uh, got all of that schooling behind him, did, uh, did wonderfully and he's going to be a, a great servant of the Lord. We love him. He was here last uh, summer and, and always such a great attitude. Well, there was a card and I don't know where it went to. I, I started passing it out. Where is it right now? Okay, Mary has it. So uh, uh, while, while we're doing this, if we get this done before the, the, uh, the preaching so nobody's distracted, after you sign the card, if you want to sign the card, go ahead and do that and we'll just gather it all. And if you would like to give something to this couple from you, um, then what I want you to do is tonight in this offering, go ahead and, and signify what you will be giving. Even if it's online, then we, we need to know that because I'd like for us to be collecting it tonight, right after the service. Uh, Brother Paul, if you could uh, just figure out all the, all the uh, commitments that came in and we'll just write one check. I'll put it in this card. We'll give it to them personally, okay? So, uh, so if you would like to do that for Kate and Emmanuel, on their wedding and their uh, their endeavor of serving the Lord, uh, graduating and getting married. And if you'd like to let them know that you love them and you'd like to uh, show your appreciation for them and you, that you're going to be praying for them and you're in support behind them, then please do that. Anything collected tonight will go on that check. Even if you don't give it tonight, but you intend, uh, it'll go on that check. And so we'll just go ahead and write one check and put it in that uh, offering envelope. Um, so if we can... Um, uh, thank you, Mary, for, for doing that. Um, let's see, in the back, uh, Alex, if you want to watch where this card is, and, and sometimes something like this, uh, somebody signs it and it dies because we've, you know, nobody knows where it's at. So you watch where this card is. Make sure it, it uh, filters through the rest of the auditorium. And if, any, if anybody needs it, make sure that you see Alex, okay, and, and go ahead and, and get that and uh, sign it if you want to sign it. And then if you, if you would put it on my desk afterwards, sometimes something like that gets lost. So we, we want to... Uh, keep an eye on. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. Uh, so let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer and you give as unto the Lord and the Lord will bless you. And isn't that a wonderful thing to be a part of God's work? I am so excited for this church and for the prospects of what God is doing and will be doing here. And uh, so let's go ahead and give with Thanksgiving tonight. Lord, thank you so much for this, your uh, service, your church here. Lord, we we're so grateful for everything that you've done and that you are doing and that you, you will do. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to stay close to you. Help us to, to uh, be sacrificial for you. Lord, help us to, to extend ourselves and watch you bless in many ways. And so, Lord, we ask that you would take this offering that we're about to give. And Lord, that you would just go ahead and uh, bless uh, the gift and the giver. And for those that do give towards the uh, Jimenez wedding, Lord, I pray that you would just bless in that offering and allow this to be uh, uh, taken as a, a real blessing to this couple who is uh, in uh, your service 
Uh, and so, Lord, we pray that you just bless that. Lord, I pray that you just uh, receive not only our, our finances and, and the fruit of physical things, but, Lord, our, our uh, thanksgiving and our gratitude for being such a wonderful God to us. And, Lord, we ask again that tonight you would speak to each and every one of us in the service. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. That's awesome. We are, we're, I'm telling you, we're spoiled. God has blessed us richly uh, with some people that have some skill and some talent when it comes to using uh, these instruments, the pianos. Uh, and uh, it's not about the talent or the ability, it's about the heart. But the Bible does say that David played skillfully on the harp. And uh, it takes a lot of discipline and effort to be able to play a song like that. Uh, and so thank you, Abby, for using your talent. And it made me think of a testimony, uh, really a praise. Um, and uh, this is just how God works, uh, but it takes a lot of practice and effort and emphasis uh, when it comes to being able to uh, play like that. And we are blessed with uh, Miss Sarah and Miss Jordan uh, and several other piano uh, people and teachers and students. And I'm thankful that God has placed those people in our church to be able to develop the next generation, uh, and uh, one of the cool things about that is God has blessed us with instruments like uh, this one over to my right. That was a gift uh, that was given to us. That's about an eight thousand dollar piano. Uh, this one we got at a rock solid deal uh, just a couple of years ago, and uh, have the two. Uh, then the music room is now functional again. I don't know if you saw that, but the flooring is in there, and we placed the piano back in there. But this is what happened this week. Uh, this week, um, I was on Facebook Marketplace. Usually when I get on Facebook, that's what I'm doing is getting on Facebook Marketplace. And I happened to see a beautiful Kohler & Campbell. It's a SKG 500. It's one step up from this piano. It's about an $8,800, uh, $8,500 piano. It's white, like a, a crisp white color. Uh, and it was on Facebook Marketplace, and it said moving sale. Uh, and so I saw it, and a lady named Miss Kim, I reached out to her, and this is all I said. I said, uh, or her 
post said, I'm uh, needing to sell it, make an offer, I have to move, uh, and it's not able to fit where I'm going, and it was a location in Bellevue. Uh, and so I just reached out to her and I said, hey, uh, my name is Lamar Art, I'm with Wooden Valley Baptist Church, and uh, I, I just thought I'd share this with you. Uh, you know, you could either sell it, and that'd be great, and that's fine, and uh, you can ignore this message if you do end up selling it, but if you get in a bind and it's something that you'd like to do, to donate it to a church, you can get a tax deduction letter or a, a, you know, something that will be counted as charitable giving and it will be used for the gospel. Uh, and so she messaged me back and she said, when can you be here? And so I, I did not think that, I, the I, first thing I thought is it's a scam. No way it's real. Uh, and so I reached out to her. I called her. Uh, and she had very, very broken English. Uh, and so I, 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 I kind of, I'm, I'm not really sure if this is real or not. And so I go over to Bellevue, probably one of the nicest houses that I've ever seen. Uh, and I walked inside. She welcomed me in. She showed me the piano. I played it myself. And I don't know pianos like Sarah or Abby or Jordan, but it was, I mean, nice feel. Uh, there wasn't any dings on it. It was in perfect immaculate condition uh, and I was talking to her and she said yeah my sister is the one who handled uh, the posting of it and she was reading me the responses and someone or, uh, offered 4,500 someone offered 3,000 and I had several different offers and then she said somebody offered for you to donate it to a church she said that's what I want to do she said my uh, my uh, my nephew is my pastor and she goes to a church in Bellevue or excuse me Redmond she says my uncle is a pastor and there were like four or five different people that were in her family that were pastors and so she's donating it to the church. Is that not so cool? God, I'm telling you what, he loves his people and he loves the emphasis that we put on good godly music uh, and I'm looking forward to putting that into the music room. The piano we have in there, so thankful that God provided that at no cost as well. But if you've played it before, uh, it's got, uh, I can't remember the, the expression or the actual title of it, but it's an old harp that's like pre-1950s, so it sounds very bar-ish and, and almost southern gospel-ish uh, and uh, that's why some of our teens are singing off key is because they've been using that piano over there uh, rather than using these types of pianos, but uh, uh, we're thankful for that, and we're going to uh, look to give that away to somebody, and we're going to have a, a very nice piano for the music room, uh, for uh, uh, music lessons, and for group practices, and so I'm just thankful for our music, and I'm thankful for uh, talent like we just heard, and I'm thankful for what the Lord is doing musically here at the church, and so just thought I'd share that with you real quick. Esther chapter 6, go to Esther chapter number 6, uh, and uh, we are getting back into our series, or continuing in our series that we began a few weeks ago, uh, Where's God? God, a study of the book of Esther. Uh, and tonight, just a quick thought, uh, a short message, uh, but you would expect nothing less from me because I really am a short-winded preacher, right? Uh, uh, I, I, I think that I've proven that. Uh, why, why are you looking at me that way? Uh, I preach for 28 minutes on Wednesday night. Thank you very much. And so uh, how many times do you have to play basketball to be a basketball player? One time. How many times do you have to go bowling to be a bowler? One time. How many short messages do you need to preach to be a short-winded preacher? One short message. And so you're welcome for that, by the way. And uh, I, I am looking forward to continuing in that series Wednesday night. Uh, but really just a simple thought that we're going to look at. And I love this particular chapter, and I don't want to spoil it or get ahead of myself. I caught Brother James reading ahead tonight. Shame on you. Don't read ahead. Uh, you need to be surprised and act like this is the first time that you've ever heard this stuff. Uh, but this is where things start to get a little bit interesting in Esther chapter number 6. Uh, uh, and we have now found ourselves, or we find ourselves yet again in a very pivotal moment in our narrative as we progress through the life and the story of Esther. And so just last week, she has appeared before King Ahasuerus, and she's done it unannounced, which is a big no-no. You don't go before Ahasuerus uh, or the king of the Medo-Persian Empire unannounced. Uh, uh, if you were to do that, you would be dismissed, or at the very least dismissed, or it could have even potentially meant that you would be put to death. Uh, and we know that uh, Ahasuerus is very emotional. He's very insecure. At that particular moment in time, uh, historians say that he was battling depression because he was really a failure of a king. He's already put away Vashti, his first wife, and so uh, it was a big deal. I hope that we understood. It was a big deal for her to go and took a lot of faith and, and took a lot of dependence upon God when you have to stand alone. That's what we looked at last week as she would appear before uh, King Ahasuerus. And so she's going and 
before she does, she tells Mordecai and the people in Shushan and the provinces as well as her maidens to fast and to pray for three days. And really, this was a, and I've said it multiple times, a spiritual response to a physical catastrophe. As she's looking at the hopeless situation, she responds spiritually to a physical catastrophe. And uh, she's about to do, again, the unthinkable in appearing before the king, which is, again, something that you wouldn't do. But during that process of time, we know that Haman, during that time, was busy being noisy and tumultuous. That's the definition of Haman. He is noisy and he is tumultuous. He's causing issues for Mordecai. He's causing issues for the Jews. He's even causing issues for Ahasuerus. He's manipulated him. He's taken advantage of his insecurities. He has been very ambiguous in how he has dealt with him. Historians say that he was trying to even overthrow the position that Ahasuerus had. And so he is busy being very noisy and very tumultuous. And he's put this wicked anti-Semitic plan or agenda together and although he hates all of the Jews and we kind of saw a little bit about why he is an Agagite which went back all the way uh, to when uh, Samuel would have uh, diced up uh, King Agag the king of the Amalekites uh, back in I believe it's 1 Samuel chapter number 15 but uh, anyways he hates all of the Jews but there's one Jew that he hates more than any other Jew and who is that? Mordecai. He despises him and he hates him. And it's mainly, uh, and I don't, want to, I don't want to paint him in a negative light, but it's mainly Mordecai's own doing and his own choosing because he refused to reverence and to bow to Haman. And so that bothered, it really did bother uh, uh, Haman. And so we closed out last week looking at his ruined moment as he comes from uh, this great banquet that was thrown. He felt like it was thrown in his honor. Uh, we see that he comes away from that. And he's on cloud nine. He has been promoted. He has been recognized. He has been exalted. And so he comes out and he's just smiling and he's excited, looking forward to the next day when he was invited to the second banquet. And who but Mordecai does he see refusing to bow right out of the gate as soon as he comes out of that banquet? There's Mordecai. Everybody else is reverencing him and it ruins his moment. And we saw last week that that was nothing short of providential. God had placed Mordecai at that moment right there to just spoil it from him or for him. But we saw this, that even though he was bothered, verse number 10 of chapter number five tells us that he kind of puts it away and says, okay, I'm not gonna focus on that. I'm just gonna go about my way. And he goes to Zeresh, his wife. He goes to his uh, uh, wise counselors, that's what it says. And he shares with them what happens. And he's, again, he's just relishing in the moment. And he's saying, I am the bee's knees. No one is as good as me. Mordecai, excuse me, uh, King Ahasuerus loves me. He's promoted me. Even his wife Esther loves me. She's invited me not to one, but to two different banquets. But then in verse, I believe it's number 16 or verse number 15, he goes back to his frustration. And he says what? All of this availeth me nothing. This is, uh, I'm angry and I'm bitter and I am upset because Mordecai refuses to bow. And Zeresh, his wife and his his friends and his counselors, advise him to erect this 75 foot gallow and to go before King Ahasuerus and to instruct him and to tell him, hey, uh, this guy is a problem in our kingdom. Would you grant me permission to put him to death? He's already granted you other uh, anti-Semitic plans and agendas and indictments. And so why would he not grant you this request? And the Bible says that it pleases Mordecai, or excuse me, it pleases Haman, and he goes about building this gallow, which Haman is, or excuse me, Mordecai is going to hang from if he has anything to say about it on the very next day. And so the story continues in verse number uh, one of chapter number six. On that night, are you there? Verse number one of chapter number six, on that night, and we'll talk about the significance of that timeline here in just a moment. On that night could not the king sleep, and he commanded to bring the book of the record of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teresh, Two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hands on the king Ahasuerus. And the king said, what honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? 
Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, there is nothing done for him. In other words, Mordecai had gone completely unnoticed. And seemingly, his kind gesture in delivering King Ahasuerus from certain death had seemingly been forgotten and it had gone unnoticed. Has anybody ever been there before where your kind gesture has gone unnoticed? Maybe you've done something out of the goodness of your own heart for somebody else and they don't say thank you. They don't show recognition. Maybe it's even larger than that. Anybody ever been passed up for a promotion that you deserved at work? Well, imagine being Mordecai. Imagine being in his position. He has just delivered this information to Esther and we're gonna see here in just a moment that she goes and she certifies it in his name and he has seemingly been all but forgotten. And so real simple truth tonight I want us to look at, where's God when I go unnoticed? Where's God when I go unnoticed? Verse number three, and the king said, what honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, there is nothing done for him. Where's God when I go unnoticed? A couple quick things and we'll be done tonight. Ready? Number one, I want us to see this. God is in the delays. God is in the delays. To understand the context of what we're talking about here, it's been several months really since we looked at chapter number two. So you don't have to turn there, but look at chapter number two and it really gives us an understanding of what had been forgotten by King Ahasuerus. And I, I made this statement. I told you that yes, there is a significant portion in chapter number four and verse number 14 that we all think of when we think of the book of Esther. When Mordecai tells her, who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time time as this. We all know that and we're all familiar with that portion of, of, of Esther. But really, I would venture to say that this statement is equally as important to the narrative in the story of Esther because without it, you don't have the rest of the story. And it starts in verse number 21 of chapter number 2. In those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Big Than and Teresh, of those which kept the door, were wroth and sought to lay hands on the king Ahasuerus. And the uh, thing was known to Mordecai, who told it unto Esther the queen, and Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. And when inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. Therefore, they were both hanged on a tree. And, and I told you to remember this statement, and here is why. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. I told you to remember that, and that's why. It's because chapter number six, we read about the second installment of that statement when he is going to remember the actions and the deliverance that was provided for him by Mordecai. And so a couple of things I want us to see here in just this first section in chapter number two as we get into chapter number six of God in the delays. Here's the first thing I want you to notice. Mordecai's faithfulness. Mordecai's faithfulness. Mordecai in this situation did the right thing in spite of a conflict of interest. You say, what do you mean by a conflict of interest? Well, nobody would have more incentive to see the assassination of the anti-Semite Ahasuerus than a Jew that was living in Shushan. Would you agree with that? Uh, I'm not even talking about Haman. Ahasuerus was an anti-Semite. Ahasuerus didn't like the Jews. As a matter of fact, history tells us that just before we pick up in Esther chapter number one, or excuse me, Esther chapter number two, I believe it is, that Ahasuerus has allowed 50,000 Jews to be murdered in the 127 provinces, a little mini holocaust, and so you see that no one would have incentive to let this thing slide, to let Big Than and Teresh proceed with assassinating the king, then uh, Mordecai himself. All he has to do is let the information and the indictment fall on deaf ears and go about his merry way. He just has to go, uh, and you know, I'm not even going to pay any attention to that. Good riddance, if they do king, kill King Ahasuerus, it's better for me, and it's better for all the Jews who are living in suppression there in Shushan in the 127 provinces. As a matter of fact, I would say that a Jew would maybe even get in on the plot to kill Ahasuerus. At least that's what I would do. Hey, big fan in Teresh, how can I play my part? And so you see, this is a conflict of interest for him to do the right thing and to go before Esther and to tell her, hey, there's 
there's this plan to put out King Ahasuerus. And so I really believe that Mordecai wanted to do the right thing, even though letting this go would seemingly serve himself and serve the Jews living in Susa. And so he informs Esther of the plot to kill King Ahasuerus, and it is dealt with, and the gesture is documented there in chapter number two and verse number 23. It is documented in the chronicles of the king. And so we read that, and so knowing what we know about the information and the life-saving information that Mordecai has delivered to Esther, Esther, excuse me, surely we're going to start chapter number three with the exaltation and the promotion of Mordecai. I mean, after all, he deserved it. He has just been, uh, really, he's delivered quite literally a Ahasuerus from certain death. It was brought, and it wasn't like it was done in secret. She brings it in his name. She says, Mordecai has informed me that these two men are plotting to kill you. He deals with them. It's written in the Chronicles. And so chapter number three, we're surely going to read about the promotion and the exaltation of Mordecai. Is that what we read? No. Who gets the promotion? Haman. Who deserved the promotion? Mordecai. Who got the promotion? Haman. And so chapter number six, from chapter number three to chapter number six, where do we find Mordecai? What do we find him doing? Here's what we find him doing. He is belly aching. He is complaining. He's frustrated because he was passed up on a promotion. He gets on Twitter, free speech now. And so he posts on Twitter and says, I have been passed up for a promotion. I'm the one who deserved it. It wasn't Haman. Is that what you find him doing? Not at all. And I know that we don't read about it, but we can see through the context of Scripture that he busied himself doing really what God wanted him to do. He busied himself concerning himself with the safety of Esther, his niece. He busied himself with the deliverance of the people of Persia, the Jews that were living there in Persia. He was not consumed or concerned with not getting recognized and not getting rewarded because he knew this, that God is going to reward and he's going to exalt the humble. And so you can see that Mordecai is really nothing less than faithful. In his response, we see the faithfulness of Mordecai, but we also see, letter B, Ahasuerus is forgetfulness. And I don't know the plural of Ahasuerus. What is it? Is Ahasuerus forgetfulness or Ahasuerus is forgetfulness? I'm not really sure. Any English teachers in here? Okay. Ahasuerus forgetfulness. Ahas it's possessive. So it's just Ahasuerus apostrophe, right? Ahasuerus, thank you, uh, teacher Brother Mike, thank you so much. And so Ahasuerus' is forgetfulness, his life has just literally been saved by this random Jew that is living there in Susa. And so he writes it down in the Chronicles and he seemingly forgets all about it. Now, excuse me, not seemingly, he forgets all about it. And so the more that we learn about Ahasuerus, the more that I am convinced that he has got to be one of the worst leaders in definite militant and political history because he parties all the time. He doesn't listen to wise counsel. He promotes the wrong people. He recognizes the wrong people and he neglects to reward the right people. And so this period between chapter number two and chapter number six, it covers the span, not of a few weeks or months, or even years, it covers the span of five years. For five years, this kind gesture and this delivering gesture that Mordecai delivered has been forgotten. It has gone unnoticed, but we're going to see that God was working actually in this delay. That this, this wasn't a surprise to God. And although you and I can look at it through our timetable and say God has neglected to reward his faithful servant, God was allowing everything to fall together. He was allowing all the pieces on the chessboard to be in place before he would make his ne next move. And so we see that God is even in the delay of recognizing the faithfulness of his choice servant, Mordecai. God in the delay. Secondly, I want us to notice this. God is in the details God is in the details. I, I believe the expression is actually the devil is in the details, but I think it would be more accurately articulated that God is in the details. And in this story, we see that he is working even in the most minute and even in the smallest of details that seem so insignificant, but we can see that God is working and God is moving. Let's look at it. A couple things really quickly. First, we see divine insomnia. Divine insomnia. Verse number one, on that night, on 
that night. Now, now let's pause and let's consider the significance. And remember I told you, after these things, on that night, anytime you see a reference to a time period, especially in the book of Esther, those time periods are very significant. And so when we consider what night we're talking about, you can almost hear the power tools of Haman in the background as he's erecting this. Well, they didn't have power tools back then. But you can hear the hammer. You can hear the saw. You can hear the instructions as he's building the gallows on that night. He's building the gallows that he is hopeful that Mordecai, his arch nemesis, would hang from the next morning. Uh, And so come morning time, Haman is sure to revenge himself and avenge himself of his enemy, Mordecai, that refuses to bow. We know he's going to go and appear before the king. He's going to request that Mordecai be assassinated. And the Bible says in verse number one, on that night could not the king sleep. What a dink. What a coincidence. No, no, no. What providence. Even uh, That's just a small detail. No, that's God's detail right there. It is because of this insomnia and because he could not sleep that you see that he's wrestling and he's not able to sleep that night. And so God, he had placed Mordecai exactly where he needed to be to hear about the assassination attempt uh, against King Ahasuerus. God had written it in the Chronicles of the King. God allowed it to go unnoticed for five years. And God had Haman erect the gallows for Mordecai. God is the one who is working in all those different details. And on that night, he ensured that Ahasuerus had way too much pizza before he went to bed. Look at verse number one. On that night, could not the king sleep? And he commanded to bring the book of records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. When you're worried and you can't sleep, just read the chronicles of the king, and you'll fall asleep. You ever heard that being Crosby and White Christmas? Anybody else like to do mindless motor activities when you're having trouble sleeping? Uh, Maybe you turn on the TV and turn on some white noise, uh, or maybe you get on the phone and you're looking at things to try to digress or or try to calm down and get ready for sleep. Maybe you uh, play one of pastor's sermons so that you can get in prime position uh, and get ready to go and drift off into sleep. Uh, Anybody else like that where you gotta do mindless motor activities? Well, that's exactly what he's doing here. There's nothing more boring than reading, it's literally the diary of the king. The daily diary of the king and, and talking about his different things that he's done different edicts that he's spoken, uh, different people that he's killed. Uh, And so he's having trouble sleeping. And so he gets one of his chamberlains to come and to just, hey, read the Chronicles. I don't care where you read, but I'm struggling. And so how about you just go ahead and start reading? And randomly they pick a day. And they start reading, and, and okay, today, uh, so, so-and-so went into uh, the marketplace, and she didn't have enough money, and so she stole, and so you assassinated her. Uh, and then uh, over here, uh, somebody came, and they wanted to talk to you about a property issue, and you were in a bad mood, and so you killed them. Uh, and so then over here, a lot of killing and a lot of assassinations. And so, uh, he, okay, on this day, uh, this random... Uh, a Jewish guy named Mordecai told your wife Esther that you were going to be assassinated, and it led to your deliverance. And then on the next day, wait, 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 back up. Whoa, hold on, hold on, hold on. Back up, read that again. Oh, well, and you kind of just get it. His head pops off his pillow and says, hang on a second. Read that again. And they read about how Mordecai had delivered, really, the life of King Ahasuerus to Esther. Look at it in verse number two. It says, and it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keeper of the door, who sought to lay hands on the king Ahasuerus. And the king said, what honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, there is nothing done for him. In other words, we have overlooked something very important. We have not recognized somebody that quite literally has delivered you from certain death. And so you can see Ahasuerus, he just pops out of bed and he realizes that there has been this major oversight. And you know what we see? God is all in that detail. God is all in that detail of all nights, of all things, of all places for them to read. They read exactly where he had forgotten to recognize God's choice servant. And it wasn't by accident. It was under the purpose, under the realm of God's control. God ensured that. So that leads to this divine irony. And this is, this is where, uh, and, and I appreciated when Pastor preached this series back in COVID, you guys remember that? He couldn't make it through this portion without dying laughing, and there's a reason for that. When you read this next section, you cannot convince me that God does not have a sense of humor. Hollywood cannot write this type of stuff, right? Look here, ready? Divine irony, verse four. And the king said, who is in the court? Now Haman was come, into the outward court of the king's house to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. Again, you can't convince me that God is not a comedian right here. 
of all people, who is standing in the court, but more, excuse me, Haman is standing in the court, and I don't know why it says that he's ready to inquire the king. I don't know why he was there so early, but there he is. I'm sure his hair was all brushed. If he had any hair, I'm sure he was wearing his nicest robe. He wanted to be first in line to go in and talk to the king. I'm sure that he was just as excited as he was in chapter number five. He's whistling. He's anticipating the uh, uh, the meeting that they're going to have the next day, the, the banquet that is thrown seemingly in his honor. Just one little minor detail. I need to make sure that we assassinate Mordecai. And so who but uh, Mordecai or Haman is standing in the court. You know, you know who did that? God did that. God did that. And we see this, let her see, divine inquiry in verse number six or verse number five. And the king's servant, and I'm not pastor and I cannot read it in the vibrancy and the storyteller ability that he can, but just imagine with me that you're there. And the king's servant said unto him, behold, Haman standeth in the court, and the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said unto him, what shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Pause for a minute. Do you remember how ambiguous Haman was when he talked to the king about the indictment arising against the Jews? He doesn't say, I want to assassinate the Jews. He says, there's a certain people. And it's almost, and I'm not saying Ahasuerus is doing this on purpose, but I'm saying God is doing this on purpose. God flips the switch and does it right back to Haman. And he says, is there somebody, well, what would you do? What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? And look where his heart is in verse number uh, six. Now Haman thought in his heart, to whom would the king delight to honor more than this guy? More than myself. Again, he is on cloud nine, and now he is on cloud 53. I mean, he has just skyrocketed in his ego. The king has inquired. He has already been promoted by Ahasuerus in chapter number three. He's already been uh, to the party, one party with Queen Esther and with the king Ahasuerus. He's been invited to another party. And so right there in the middle of the night that he is just high hoeing away, building and erecting this gallow, he goes and he's inquired of the king, and the king says, hey, Hey, buddy, I, I, I like your counsel. What would you do for somebody that I find really special? You can just see his head and his ego. He thinks he's talking about himself. Verse number six, to whom would the king delight to honor more than myself? I mean, after all, what's not to love? It's me. It's Haman. You know what you see? You see God in that detail. You even see God in the egotistical agenda of Haman himself. And I love how God is going to flip the switch. Where is God when Mordecai went unnoticed? God was working in the details, even in the pride and ego of Haman himself. We see this, number three, I want you to notice. God is in the deception. God is in the deception. What does Haman say in response to this inquiry? I mean, after all, it almost seems like he's been given a blank check. What would you do for somebody that's very special to the king? He must be talking about me. And so verse number seven, he pulls back all the punches. He goes to the depths of his imagination and he says, verse number seven, and Haman answered the king for the man whom the king delighteth to honor Oh, excuse me. Uh, verse number eight. Let the royal apparel be brought, which the king useth to wear. No, you're the best. You're the best. I love you. Okay. Okay. Verse number eight. Let the, let the royal apparel be brought, which the king useth to wear, and the horse that the king rideth upon, and the crown royal which is set upon his head, and let this apparel and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that they may array the man withal, whom the king delighteth to honor, and to bring him on horseback through the streets of the city, and to proclaim before him, to proclaim before all those in Shushan, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honor. That is who, what I think that you ought to do. He goes to the depths of his imagination and really he's thinking of himself. Surely he's talking about me. Surely he's going to recognize me. Surely it's going to be me that's riding on the king's horse in the king's apparel and I'm going to have some peasant servant walking around declarating who I am. I am the man whom the king delighteth to honor. All the while, he has no clue that not only is the king not talking about Haman, but to add insult to injury, he is talking about Haman's narch nemesis, Mordecai. God is all up in that. 
God is working in the details. We see that God is working even in the deception of Haman. And lastly tonight, I want us to see this. Number four, God is in the deliverance. God is is in the deliverance. And this has been an incredible chapter. This is quite the plot twist, and it's gonna get even better next week. I'd encourage you to come back. But let's close it out in verse number 10. Then the king said to Haman, make haste. Man, that's why I have you on my team. That is great counsel. That is wise counsel. I want you to take that, and I want you to do that. I want you to implement that, and take the apparel and the horse, as thou hast said, and do even so to who? Mordecai, do even so to Mordecai the Jew that sitteth at the king's gate. Let nothing fail of that, excuse me, let nothing fail of all that thou hast spoken. Do everything that you recommended, all that in a bag of potato chips, and I want you to do it all for Mordecai the Jew. Verse 11, then took Haman the apparel and the horse and arrayed Mordecai and brought him on horseback through the streets of the city and proclaimed before him, thus shall it be done unto the man whom the king delighted to honor. Thus shall it be done for the man whom the king delighted to honor. Irony and humor. It's hilarious. Where's God when I go unnoticed? He's noticing. He's paying attention. Nothing has happened where God is up in heaven looking and saying, that wasn't according to what I wanted him to do. God is noticing. God is moving. He is recognizing the faithfulness of his servant. And he's keeping a record. And he'll come through on his promise to reward those that put him first. Reward those that prioritize him. Reward those that follow after him. Even when it seems like our behavior and even when it seems like our service goes unnoticed, God notices. God's paying attention. God's looking. In Mordecai's case, it was a whole lot sweeter, the reward and the recognition that he got had God delivered him five years before. Did you catch that? And so what do we learn from this chapter as we close it out? What do we learn? Just a couple quick things and we're going to be done tonight. Here's the first thing that we learned from chapter number six. God can use even our enemies to deliver us. God can use even our enemies to deliver us. And I mentioned this several weeks ago. But our God is not limited to using favorable people. Our God is not limited to using favorable circumstances. He can use our enemies. He even uses corrupt leaders and politicians and presidents to bring about his will and to deliver his people. And his justice and his rewards are so much sweeter when they're done in his time. God uses even our enemies, and that leads to, secondly, God chooses the perfect moment to reward his servants. His moment, his time, is part of his will and his plan. And I don't know about you, but I am glad that in our story, for at least our story, that God didn't follow the timetable that you and I think that he should have followed. Had it been me, had I been the one who was writing the book of Esther, I would have had Mordecai look the other way and just let this anti-Semite Ahasuerus fall to his death. But you know what would have happened had he done that? Had, had, had Ahasuerus been assassinated, that would have done nothing for Haman. It might have even made the situation worse for the Jews living in Susa. But God in his timing elected to allow Mordecai's faithfulness to seemingly go unnoticed so that he could reward his servant in his perfect time and use Haman to do it. Only God could do that. And here's the last one, and this one's big. God exalts the humble and he debases the proud. God always, I should say, always exalts the humble and he debases the proud and he does it in his time. We ended chapter number five with Haman going about his merry way, whistling while he went off to work to erect this beautiful uh, uh, 75 foot gallow. He is in the best of moods. And where do we end? Look at verse number 12. How's Haman doing in this situation? Verse number 12, and Mordecai came again to the king's gate, but Haman hasted to his house, mourning and having his head covered. And Haman told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends, uh, everything that had befallen him. Then said his wise men, and Zeresh, his wife, unto him. Remember what they told him before? They told him, hey, if this guy's bothering you, you should build this gallow, and you should ask King Ahasuerus if you can hang him. Now, one chapter later, look at the information and the intel that they're giving him in verse number 13. If Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews before whom thou hast begun to fall, thou shalt not prevail against him, but shall surely be 
be, fall, uh, be, fall before him. In other words, you have picked a fight with the wrong people. You've picked a fight with the wrong people. And while they were yet talking with him, it gets better, came the king's chamberlains and hasted to bring Haman unto the banquet that Esther had prepared. And we're going to see next week what unfolds. It gets so much better and so much sweeter, at least for everybody but Haman in the story, when we see what God is going to do in chapter number seven with the gallows that were supposed to be erected for Mordecai. Here's the story. And here's the purpose. God always exalts the humble, and God always debases the proud, and he always does it in his time. Not in your time, not in my time. He doesn't follow our timetable. He's not limited to do what we think that we, uh, he should do. And as a matter of fact, I find myself on the opposite end of blessing, always thanking God that he didn't let me have my way with my time. God always exalts the humble and he always debases the proud. Here's a short illustration and I'm gonna be real careful at how I share it, but this is just where my mind went and I wanna be transparent. There's a situation that unfolded just maybe two or three years ago and it happened right here at Wooden Valley Baptist Church, and I'm not going to say names, and I'm not going to say or share information or anything like that that would be damning to anybody uh, that's involved. But there was just a situation, being honest, where some things were shared and some things were said about our church, about pastor, about myself, that were simply untrue and unfair. They were said, and, and that word began to get around, and, and even some people bought into the information that was being shared. And I looked at that information, and I was so frustrated, and I was so angry. And not only was I angry at the information that was being shared, I knew something about the person who was sharing it that would remove their credibility. So I went to pastor and I said, here's what we need to do, pastor. We need to go and we need to uh, confront this person. We need to talk to this individual, and we need to, and he stopped me in my tracks, and he said, hang on, back up for a second. God always exalts the humble, and he always debases the proud, and he always does it in his time. And I didn't like that in the moment, because I knew what needed to be done seemingly in that moment. But in his wisdom, he knew something that I didn't know, and that's that God always comes through on his promise to exalt the humble and to debase the proud. And that is exactly what God did in that situation. God exalted the humble, he revoked the things that were being said about the ministry and Pastor Farinella, and he debased the proud. And you know what I learned from that situation? I sure am glad that God is in front of us, and if I want to see God come through and give me blessing and reward me, I need not get ahead of him. You hear me? Don't get ahead of God. Where's God when I go unnoticed? Don't worry about it. He's noticing. Trust him, but don't get ahead of him. Wait on him. And his rewards, listen, his rewards are so much sweeter when not only we follow what he wants, but we follow his time. God always exalts the humble and he debases the proud. Lord, I pray that you dismiss us with your blessing and I'm thankful for this truth and I'm thankful for the specific significance that it's played uh, in my life. Just studying over the past couple of months, I was reminded that uh, there's been many times where I've gotten ahead of you and you've let me have my way and I always end up in the ditch. And then there's moments where, because I am not all-knowing and I am not omniscient, uh, omniscient, I see the way that things are unfolding and I begin to question you, but I choose to trust you kind of with my hands in the air and you always prove yourself true. You always, always, always reward your faithful servants and you always debase those who pick a fight with your people. So Lord, I pray that that truth would just resonate with us very simply tonight and that would we, we would be actively not seeking your reward but seeking your will. And know that you are going to come through in rewarding us for our faithfulness and also doing it in your time. And even in moments, using our enemies to do it. Lord, only you could have done something like what happened with Haman. So who are we not to trust you? Lord, I pray that we'd learn to trust you. Every week I've mentioned that. And, and really that's what Esther is all about. Trusting the immutable God. So Lord, I pray that if you've spoken to hearts tonight, that we do business with you as we head into the invitation. And we'll give you all the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd stand to your feet, we'll have just a quick moment of invitation. And if God's spoken to you, just do business right away. We won't labor long. If he's not, then we'll uh, go into the announcements and end the service.
You can be seated. Thank you for listening and paying attention tonight. I appreciate that. And uh, we'll have the announcements here in just a second. Uh, but I just wanted to encourage you uh, not only to come back Wednesday night, looking forward to diving into that series and continuing. Really, this feels like the first installment uh, of the series Haymaker. We're looking at the book of Jude. But I want to uh, make a request. Would you be here next Sunday? Next Sunday morning while pastor's gone, I'm going to deal with with uh, something that I think is very significant and import, important. It's all important, uh, but we're going to be talking about the holiness of God. And the reason we're doing that is because the following week we go straight into revival. And my, my desire is that as a result of l- next week's message, we'd be primed and ready. And here's how we'll be primed and ready. Just by knowing who God is and realizing who it is that we're dealing with and who deals with us. We're dealing with the immutable uh, king of glory who inhabiteth the heavens and the earth. You're talking about the holy God. And so I'm looking forward to dealing with that next Sunday as we get primed and ready. And at the end of the service, we're going to spend some special time in prayer as we ask God to have his way in our hearts as we head into revival. So looking forward to that. All right, we'll have the announcements at this time and then we'll be dismissed with a word of prayer. What a blessing to hear the Bible taught and preached. If you'd like to connect with Pastor Farinella, simply send him a message at pastor at woodenvalleybaptist.org. Don't forget to like and subscribe and tune in tonight at 6 p.m.